Okay, welcome everybody to this session on a code of ethics for science. So the idea that scientists should have a code of ethics has been around for a long time. And all of them, I think, would say implicitly they do have a code of ethics. But the attempt to formalize it, which has happened from time to time, has never really gained much traction because unlike engineers and unlike doctors, you don't have professional institutions who can license you to practice, for example, and therefore there is no penalty if you disobey the code. Nevertheless, in this fractured world that we've heard a lot about um, in this week, um, it is important that trust in science is maintained. And what we're here to discuss today is a code of practice that's been put together as a result of the initiative of the World Economic Forum, which is to bring together young scientists from across the natural sciences, all of them under 40. This has been going on over um, the last few years, but this particular initiative is a code of conduct that they have put together. And just to very quickly highlight some of the aspects of it, which we're going to discuss before I introduce the speakers. The headlines are engaging with the public, pursuing the truth, minimizing harm, engaging with decision makers, supporting diversity, being a mentor, and being accountable. If you look at the full copy of it, it's not a very big document, each of those principles, if you like, has one page where they summarize the principle, the importance of the principle, the measures by which you can strengthen it and practice it. Um, you'll find copies over there, and it, there is also a copy on the World Economic Forum's website. Um, if, if you look at all of that, these are very big challenges, actually. They sound quite simple, but in fact, to implement them requires structural support. And I hope that some of what we'll hear today will look at the way in which institutions in science can support the scientists who wish to practice these principles explicitly. So um, I think that's probably enough from me. You will have a chance to ask questions, I hope, although we are short for time. I can't see a clock, but I have a watch, so I'll try and keep track. So um, we have three eminent speakers here, actually Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, uh, who's president of the European Research Council, a fantastic funding agency uh, set up within the European Union. Um, if you're funded by them, you are a prestigious person, just by definition. Um, um, Jody Halpern is Professor of Bioethics and Medical Humanities at the University of California in Berkeley. And Gabriella Hook is the Associate, Associate Professor in Information Technology and Electrical Engineering at the very distinguished university in Switzerland, ETH Zurich. <coughs> So we'll start with Gabriella, who is going to give us some of the background and motivation for this code. Gabriella. Okay, thank you. Um, so the young scientists, and I was one of them, um, came to together at the um, meeting of the uh, new champions in Tianjin in 2016. And on the program was a workshop which was entitled, What Values and Rules Should Scientists Adopt and Adapt to Their Research? And it was uh, moderated by Nita Farahani. And the goal basically was to um, discuss issues that we have in our daily research and then also write this code of, of ethics. So we had some very interesting discussions. It went from um, how should I uh, make sure that my research is, um, is not doing any harm? How can I uh, make sure that I can justify the funding that I'm receiving, that's usually public funding, and so on. So um, there were lots of discussions, and we ended up with a bunch of principles that we felt are important um, to us. So we then left the, um, the, the, the meeting, and um, Later on, had uh, quite a few uh, phone calls and discussions, and I have to thank Sandrine, who uh, from the World Economic Forum, who uh, basically was the glue put, uh, pulling us all together to really put this in writing. And um, so we had assigned uh, multiple scientists to each of the, of, the, of the seven principles. So we initially had more, but then realized we um, should combine some of them into one single one and started writing this. And um, this is basically the outcome that we have now. Now, the motivation for this um, were manifold. One, um, 
one can also put it into the relation of what we're seeing with the digitalization, with more data that we're having, so people getting information from all kinds of places, but also in research we're using more and more data on our own, so how can we make sure that um, all of our research is still transparent, and how can we make sure that or, or, um, the output that we're creating is, uh, is credible and um, can be also understood by, uh, by the general public. Um, then the, another motivation um, was that we feel that it is really, really important that we as scientists uh, stay credible in the research that we're doing because we want to have this research have impact on, on, uh, on policy makers and uh, basically the research being translated into, into actions. And if we don't adhere to something like this, like code of ethics, then we're risking that we're losing that credibility. So if everybody basically complies with this, we can make sure that uh, we are perceived as, as credible institutions. So that was one of them. Then I think another maybe uh, uh, motivation also um, is that particularly as young scientists, we're under a lot of pressure of delivering uh, research, having publications, etc. And to make sure that particularly during this time, we're also uh, making sure that we're not uh, feel this pressure so much that we're uh, not adhering to uh, to code of ethics. Uh, so these were the motivations and also, as was mentioned earlier, also there are uh, various code of ethics from different uh, institutions or groups, including uh, the institution that I'm uh, in my community, which is the electrical <coughs> engineering community. So there's an IEEE uh, code of ethics. And I looked it up, and uh, it was basically this long on a website, um, each with like a few bullet points, very general. Just um, to give you an example, one is to maintain and improve our technical competence and to undertake technological tasks for others, only if qualified by training and or experience. But there's no um, description of what exactly this means and what it, uh, uh, what it entails in terms of measures and, and actions. Um, then also, um, most of these code of ethics are very specific to a particular community. And uh, that can be very different from, from medical to, uh, to, to electrical engineering. And there should definitely be specific uh, codes. But we felt it's necessary, particularly as we're moving more towards multidisciplinary research, that such a code of ethics, which covers all kinds of research, is, um, is very important. And that's how we ended up with these seven principles. So there's two versions. One is a short one, just one page, and then uh, a longer version, which describes uh, more about each of the each of the principles. Gabriela, can I just ask you: is there is there a way in which you and your colleagues felt this could be taken forward by any specific body or individual? And how would you like to see it taken forward by mm -hmm. somebody? <laughs> Well, we would, I mean, our goal is that um, the various research institutions do endorse this, or there's a way how to endorse this and um, make it or distribute it within within their institutions. Right. The World Economic Forum, of course, is a, a fantastic platform to um, to get this, get this out. So let's, so let's take an example, which I know you were involved with in particular, which is about mentoring. Mm -hmm. So what, what this report includes in an appendix is stories, narratives out of academic environments about that which illustrate the need for these principles. And I'm just going to read this out quite quickly. I was fortunate enough to have three very different mentors in the early stages of my career, who nevertheless had a lot in common. They were supportive, demanding, passionate, and creative. Thinking that I had no training in mentoring, I later realized that they had shown me the way leading by example. I now try to demonstrate the same positive behavior in my lab and discovered how rewarding it is to see one's students succeed and how lucky we are to contribute to training the next generation of scientists. So that's a good news story. The bad news is that you're depending on the example of your supervisors, and there are plenty of people who don't necessarily have those examples, mm -hmm. and there was no training. Yeah. So I'm intrigued to know whether you think institutions that you know, and that are probably represented in this room, actually, um, should be doing specifically more about training and about instilling a culture from the top down, where academics are very resistant to that in some cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, I think universities or general research institutions should have mentoring programs, mentoring the mentor, as well as um, then also specifically having mentors and mentees. So with the first, I mean that um, the, there should be some training on how can I be a good 
good mentor and there's a description of what we think a good good mentor is such as building a trusted environment so that the mentee doesn't um, doesn't feel that there's something that the mentee can't tell because it could have some consequences that the mentor always puts the priorities for the mentee first so not the own uh, own interest and, and so on. So um, just having this this environment where the, the mentee feel, feels um, feels comfortable. So um, getting that into um, practice, like uh, teaching the, the researchers how to be a mentor, and and then of course having uh, mentorship programs within within the university, and that entails um, senior faculty being mentors for junior ones. I th not many universities have this, yeah. um, but maybe also giving a bit more thought to uh, teaching how to, yeah. how to mentor. Right. So now let's move to the funding side, although Jean-Pierre, you're a researcher yourself, so feel free to comment on anything you want about this from your own experience, but do perhaps give us your viewpoint about all of this. Well, thank you for inviting me to contribute to this discussion, which I think is a very, very important one for the credibility of scientists altogether and also for the healthy uh, internal life of the scientific community. So at the European Research Council, maybe let me start by the structural measures we have. The, the first one is that uh, we have two standing committees at the at the uh, European Research Council, TRC. Uh, one is a committee on panels, because that's the responsibility of the Scientific Council to choose the panel members. It's hard work. It's more than 2,000 people who are members of our panel, so we have to find more or less 400 to 500 every year, so it's uh, some work. But the other one is called the Standing Committee on Conflict of Interest, Misconduct and Ethics. And uh, this committee, uh, of course, we, we do have general rules about conflict of interest, about misconduct, and so on. But any time uh, the people who are monitoring the, the, the applications and also the, uh, the way the research uh, supported by ERC is developing, any time the scientific officers who are monitoring this have a doubt, that is, it feels slightly outside the thing, then we come to this committee. This committee consists of seven members of the scientific council. And more or less, I would say, once a week we are uh, consulted on one issue or another. Most of the cases, most of the cases, it's really a conflict of interest. We are extremely uh, careful about that. That is, uh, panel members who realize that uh, actually they are associated to research which is proposed, and therefore uh, either it's really so directly involved that we just take them out or uh, it's just that they have a marginal interaction and then they will not be reporting or discussing this specific proposal, but they will still be members of the panels. So we try to be extremely uh, precise about that. Of course, the, the other, so this is one structural measure, of course, which is uh, very, uh, extremely important for us and this committee is very, very active. And the person who chairs this is one of our vice presidents. Um, Klaus Bock at the, at the moment. So this is one uh, structural measures, which of course is uh, is uh, very important. The other side of the um, of the thing is that every proposal which comes to ERC uh, is going, of course, to a scientific review, which leads to decision to fund or not fund. But then after that, we have an ethical review, and this ethical review has different dimensions. One dimension, of course, is to you see, the, one of the features of the European Union is that it has uh, regulations, in particular on stem cells or structures, uh, things like, of this nature, which tends, which in some cases is different from the uh, regulation of a given country. And sometimes researchers, they are very much aware, and their institutions, of what is the law in their country. But they are not aware of the regulation at EU level. So we need to make sure that people are actually complying, because we cannot give European money if people are, are not uh, respecting this law. So we do that. There are other dimensions which are more and more, I mean, they are um, really, uh, people care about interaction between researchers and object of research. So object of research can be, of course, material things, but they can be also people. So sometimes you, if you're a sociologist, of course, you have to go to do field work. If you're an anthropologist, you have to do field work. And so now you need to be sure that the, the rights uh, of the people are properly done. And then you are coming to extremely difficult cases because typically uh, if you want to have ahead of time the list and uh, the uh, approval of the people you want to interview if they are in Amazonia 
of course, you're not going to be able to provide this. So how do you make sure through an interactive process that this is being taken care of? So actually, recently, we were in a situation where the ethical review was becoming almost uh, blocking some, uh, the signing of some agreements because the uh, ethical panels were so strict that actually, because they, were, they wanted to know everything five years ahead of time. And so then you are touching the one point which I really want to make, that one has to be very much conscious of the huge diversity of the research and of the way you do research, the way you conduct research, and also the consequences. So this is the second point about the structural thing. So we are very serious about that. Now let me come to something different, which is when we sign a contract, as you know, we don't sign contracts with individuals, we sign contracts with the host institution. And one thing now we really, um, uh, an institution cannot sign a contract if it doesn't have on its side a structure which will guarantee that if there is a scientific misconduct, they will be able to handle it. So they must have ethical panels or ethical structures to be able, of course, from one institution to the other, it will have a different name, but they should guarantee that they can deal that. One reason for this is that we are not in a position to, to conduct um, actually uh, um, to, to conduct really uh, inquiries on this. So we have to rely on the host institution to do it. And of course, we come to them. Uh, we are, when we get to know that there is some problem, we definitely want to uh, go to them and tell us what you do. The main difficulty, in particular now we are touching with, a, with a social media, is that very often if there is some kind of a rumor or you know now some disciplines have some uh, websites where you can anonymously uh, denounce uh, misconduct. Mm -hmm. I personally feel as a mathematician really something uh, very um, um, uh, uncomfortable about because uh, anonymous denunciation for me is, is not the right way of working. At least as a mathematician, we don't function this way. If we disagree with the proof, we just claim why it's uh, wrong, but maybe <laughs> it's simpler in our case. But um, anyway, so this happens. And then, of course, immediately in the media, this is picked up. But if you want to do a serious uh, study about misconduct, you need to really have the people to explain the situation. Some cases are very simple and clearly people have misbehaved. Some other cases, it's much more subtle because uh, multiple uh, um, groups can be involved. Uh, it has to do with relying on some data and sometimes the data is not public data. So, so it could be quite involved. And therefore you really need the, the inquiry to be uh, really uh, put together and followed, uh, following a really good procedures from a uh, justice point of view, that is really somebody who is accused should have the right to defend himself or herself in a proper way uh, until you prove that the person has misbehaved. So this is really one point where definitely at this moment uh, there, are s there is a tension between immediate reaction because you don't want public money to be given to people who misbehave on the other hand, you need to be sure that the way you establish that people have misbehaved is really done in a very professional way, respecting the rights of people. So this is, uh, on the funder's point of view, the way we are organized. That is, we, uh, of course, any time we see something, we, we get to the people with whom we sign a contract, namely the host institution. And uh, now to finish, uh, I definitely feel that at this moment, uh, and coming to what has been said before, uh, the, uh, in the training of researchers, this demand, ethical dimension is not sufficiently present. And it should be done in the right way, not by adding one course that you tick uh, to be sure that you are allowed to prepare a PhD, but it has to be done as much as possible in relation to the work that people do. So I think it has to be as concrete as possible, but people, uh, I mean, people in charge of labs, people in charge of teams, have really to include this in the training of their colleagues, their uh, co-workers, and uh, I'm not sure this is done everywhere. So therefore, this dimension of uh, training, exposure, reflection um, is absolutely necessary. So um, just to comment uh, on the, the anonymous allegations side of it. So um, now I'm speaking as an institution as ourselves, Nature uh, and the Nature Journals, which have their own parallel structures to everything you've mentioned pretty much in terms of misconduct cases and how we deal with those and how we try to judge things. Some of those have arisen thanks to, and I mean thanks to, some of these anonymous websites. And of course, you cannot act solely on an anonymous tip-off. But they do actually often, and, and uh, um, so I'll mention one in particular, PubPeer, which may be the one that many life scientists think of anyway. Um, 
and the the virtue that Papier has or has evolved anyway is that there is an there is a demand that you have some evidence for your assertion so it's not just a baseless accusation even if it's anonymous and as we know with anonymous peer review there is a virtue in anonymity sometimes and that's contentious and people can debate that um, but nevertheless that that I think is interesting but it also refers to a developing aspect of academia which is social media and I'm not sure whether the code of ethics I'm going to before I come to you Jody I will come to you but I just wanted to ask Gabriella do the social media set the context for this in any particular way or have you have you thought adequately as a group of young scientists about the way the social media are changing or evolving in the in the realm of science I, mean, I can't recall if we really talked about this during the workshop, but it definitely plays an important role because information gets out there so quickly. And also, um, one thing that we did certainly talk about was um, misrepresentation of scientific results. Yeah. So that somebody takes the results and then um, draws conclusions which we were not stating in that, that right. form. So I guess with social media, this is... Uh, uh, much faster propagating. Well, you have a principle in here that you're meant to engage as a part of your duty. <laughs> exactly. To, yeah. to engage, and that's yes. quite a tough call sometimes, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, the, the, the thought behind the principle with uh, engaging uh, the public has uh, multiple dimensions. Um, one is that uh, lots of the funding that we receive is coming from taxpayers, and that we do have a responsibility to, uh, to justify research that we're doing. But also, of course, we want that the public uh, perceives our work that we're doing as, as important right. and um, also uses it in, in, in possibly in their, in, their, in their daily lives or uh, applies certain things that we, that we can guide, guide them on. Right. So it is really important that we... Um, I mean, one main aspect of this is also that researchers, scientists, we tend to um, present things in a language to our peers as opposed to the general public, so right. that this is also an important uh, okay. aspect. Okay. So before I come to you, I'm going to just make a little announcement here. We have in the room at least two heads of universities, and they're not here on the platform. <laughs> so at some point, at least two people in this room might have an interesting point of view to put about some of this stuff because I think the role of the institutions themselves is absolutely crucial. Jody, do make your comments generally, react to whatever you've heard, whatever well, you like. It's interesting, I, because I know we have a big focus on very practical um, applications, which I think both of you, especially Jean-Pierre just now, how did, what is this really, how does the rubber meet the road? I hope you'll all bear with me, because that's the opposite of what I was requested to do. I'm, I'm a philosopher, I'm a bioethics professor, so I was asked to think conceptually about these principles, and how, and what we can, you know, do they make sense? How coherent are they? And it turns out to be very relevant to, I think, unifying the conversation. I think that these principles are, um, they could be read as a baseline, and they can also be extended to be an aspirational standard. And I think that um, the most important thing I guess I can say today, which is relevant to the university professors, I mean, uh, 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 presidents and everyone, is that what people I think don't understand, everybody is very familiar with conflicts of interest in every field here. And I think the fact that there's so much rigor in, in the European Research Council about conflicts of interest is an incredible role model for the world. You know, and I, I knew that even before you described because I know, and it's just, I have so much regard for that. And I think that these standards, um, I, I'm gonna say a lot of positive things. I told Gabriella, I, I read a lot of codes of ethics and usually they're just incoherent, to be honest. Um, this is an excellent code of ethics, both at the baseline and the aspirational level. The thinking behind it, I would read the whole document if I were anybody in this audience. So I'm very impressed with it. Um, but what I wanna say is that the, Conflicts of interest, where you have your, is basically you have something about your own self-interest that's ruling your actions. So I, I'm very familiar with this in medical ethics, where doctors do something. They either don't refer a patient because it'll be, de you know, they'll lose their salary in managed care if they make a cons uh, an expert referral, or they give too many expensive treatments because they benefit, they own, you know, the MRI or whatever. Um, but most of my career is much more at the aspirational level and the university education level, which I think we need desperately, which has to do with not conflicts of interest, but conflicts of obligation. 
which is when you have two different ethical obligations that conflict with each other. And how do you get educated at a high level to mentor people in that? And that's where I think the, the conversation needs to be. Because to me, while I, I, I applaud these principles, it's very obvious to me that they conflict in many cases. And what's, there's no guidance for uh, scientists generally into what you do when they conflict. And I'll just give you a few examples. Um, it's interesting, I, I even have a social, I edited a social media one because of your question, but the first example, which many people here are fam familiar with, um, is the, when, when um, there was, a, and you have it in your, your uh, examples, uh, when synthesizing mammalian uh, uh, transfer strain of the bird flu virus, when that was done, how to synthesize it, I don't know if it was nature or science, you'll have to forgive science. me. Science. Okay, sorry. Um, had to make a very serious decision about whether to publish it because it's a dual use issue, which means people can use the mechanism to go and do a lot of bad. You know, we have Maria Di Cristina from Scientific American, as well as Phil and others here who have to make these decisions all the time. So that's a great example of a conflict of obligation. And maybe I'll say little so you can maybe pipe in about that. Another conflict of obligation that many people here are probably familiar with in, in public health is when we had the um, PETRA trials in sub-Saharan Africa around the late 90s to, we had first shown in, in the US and other um, trials that AZT reduced maternal to fetal transmission of HIV by two thirds. And that was proven. And then there was a desire to do studies in sub-Saharan Africa about how, how short a course of AZT would be able to at least reduce transmission partly because the, the course that reduces it by two thirds is long and expensive and there wasn't the infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa to provide that course long term and there wasn't the governance for, for doing that. So the idea was that it was truly best for the local populations to figure out if a much shorter, more efficient and economic treatment might at least reduce some degree of transmission. But to find out according to the highest standards of certain scientists who were very ethical in their <coughs> ideals, there had to be a placebo group. But that Marsha Angel, the editor of the New England Journal and many others found that really appalling because it was proven that it would reduce maternal fetal transmission. So you were asking a group of women to be research subjects in sub-Saharan Africa where they would be randomized to placebo so that they would be pregnant, have an HIV positive, situation where they would transmit to their fetus and we wouldn't protect them from that. So there's a lot, there's huge clash in two really important ethical s systems there. And then I can give you a, a social media one quickly where I worked with Kyle Pruitt, who's a child psychology researcher many, many years ago at Yale. And he did research on, on stay-at-home dads with working moms and found that the, ch the children had, you know, higher school performance, better health, you know, all this stuff. And what he was showing really is that when you have a working um, mom with a stay-at-home dad, the child actually gets more hours of contact from both parents because working mothers at the end of the day still spend a lot of time with the children. And this is 20 years ago. So that was really what he showed, and he was very rigorous about it, was the number of hours a day a parent of any gender spends with a child has a huge uh, positive impact on the child's well-being. But I was with him when we met with the New York Times, and he said, they are gonna misreport this. This is before we even had social media. It was just media, like the New York Times. And we sat there and watched the front page of the New York Times say, fathers produce better children than mothers. And we watched it happen. We reported it accurately. I tried to help him with the ethics of it. So it's, and now it's a million times bigger with social media. So those are examples of conflicts of obligation. I'll just submit that at Berkeley, we have doctoral level scientists take rigorous courses with me about a systematic way to approach these conflicts and I wish we had more time to talk about it. Thanks very much, Judy. Um, you, you mentioned the avian flu examples and actually I wrongly said it was science. It was actually science and nature. We both had papers. The one I thought you were referring to was, and this is an interesting case of harm, right? Of, of, or alleged harm. So science did publish a paper where they, people synthesized a virus, the, a smallpox, a pox virus. And a lot of people could see no point in that experiment. And it was reintroducing a harmful organism in a way that was unnecessary. But um, you can have an argument about that. What was a much more interesting argument, so I'm not gonna take long about this, but it does relate to some of the issues we've talked about was when the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity 
advised in the US that these two papers submitted to science, so this was while they were submitted to Nature and to Science, which showed how you could make a flu virus more transmissible, and in so doing were trying to explain how diseases are transmitted, and therefore what you might do, for example, in future de development of vaccinations. So there was a completely virtuous motivation behind this. Nevertheless, the academics, especially on, S on NSABB, were saying that this is too risky because this could be used as a weapon. And so there was ages of discussion involving the National Institutes of Health, the security community, and, and so on, about whether we should publish them redacted, that whether you should publish it, taking away the, the information. And after a lot of cogitation about that, we decided we would never do that. You simply cannot publish redacted papers. I mean, who, to whom do you then decide you're going to supply the information and so on? So, okay, this is a particular case. But one of the, 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 one of, one of the interesting things was that the security community, community were much more willing to see these papers published than some academics who was sort of somehow being protective beyond their own responsibilities. <laughs> so that was interesting. But also, once you saw these academics in the room, and one of them in particular, you were just so taken by their commitment to safety in the labs mm -hmm. that you were reassured. And you could feel the tone of one of the critical meetings changing because this person was there and conveying this do no harm type of ethos. Um, the other one wasn't quite so responsible in his presentation. And if it had just been him, I don't quite know how that might have gone. <laughs> so I'm just saying how safety and adherence to statutes, if you like, statutory things, which can get quite shoddy if you're not careful, is absolutely crucial as part of this code. And I think it's in there. Mm -hmm. I think it's to do with the harm <laughs> paragraph. OK, enough from me. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, ask uh, one more question about the institutions of science but before turning over to the audience to ask them to make some comments or to um, question you guys. So in Britain, um, a funding agency did something quite draconian. You, you made the point, Jean-Pierre, that you wouldn't, you're not able to fund universities that do not have in place a code of practice about misconduct. Um, and that's quite a general situation. Not a code, it's a structure. Oh, it's a structure, I'm so diseases. sorry, a formal structure that is there to deal with it. Um, and one of the funders in Britain did something much more draconian in relation to culture in a university or in the universities in Britain. So there is a thing called the Athena Swan scheme where an external body validates actions taken by an organisation and usually universities on behalf of women how do you run your department on behalf of the, the success of the career ambitions of women? How do you arrange meeting timetables? Do you provide crash support? I mean, very practical stuff. And if you get a bronze certificate, you're showing willingness by having a plan. If you get a silver certificate, you've achieved something over three years, let's say. And the head of a funding agency, the National Institutes for Health Research in Britain, which is the, the biggest single public funding agency, decided that if you didn't have a silver certificate of proven development in this particular area, she would not fund you. That was really draconian. People now are studying the outcome of that, and they're going in and doing qualitative surveys of academics. There was one recent one about Oxford, and it, it absolutely did have some impact. And people speak generally favorably, even though you can game it, and so on and so forth. So, Jean-Pierre, <laughs> do you see funding agencies, not just the ERC, which of course is dealing with many countries, but national funding agencies, as able to put leverage, not just on that issue, which is included in here, diversity in the interests of underrepresented groups, but also some of the other almost philosophical points in this document? No, I think uh, for sure we have a responsibility because definitely we, we make research uh, possible. So from that point of view, uh, we are in the sense on uh, the fuel of research. So uh, if, the, if you turn the tap uh, off, then of course uh, it has consequences. Uh, the point I was making, do, uh, referring to in our pre-discussion in the sense is the, the fact in the case of Europe, actually the level of organization of the various uh, countries, the various institutions is diverse enough that uh, if you just come up with a... a I mean, the measure that you describe, which I, in a sense, uh, feel comfortable about in, uh, in its uh, aim, in, in its philosophy, 
definitely uh, it will be seen by some countries or some institutions as definitely uh, something which uh, discriminate against them because they have not reached this level of organization and also as you know the situation in particular in terms of promotion of uh, women uh, among scientists which is certainly uh, something absolutely uh, fundamental to do um, is in different countries taken differently so so at this moment uh, we don't have a playing level field that we, we can use but still for funding agencies I think because of their role uh, and also because at, at ERC we take that very seriously. We have what we call the PI-centric events, which is really um, uh, the, the agency which is managing the, the program is really visiting every year a very significant number of institutions and of very often also bringing researchers from other institutions nearby to just uh, explain how we function, to get critiques, but also to at the same time use these uh, channels to explain uh, how we monitor, for example, the situation of women in, uh, in ERC, but also how we I have identified things which are really uh, taking women uh, away from, from the contract. Uh, also concerning ethics, this is something we, which is discussed systematically first by describing what we do, but also explaining things we may do, so people have to prepare themselves. So I think we have a pedagogical dimension. Of course, it can go up to the level you mentioned, which is you just uh, start to tell people, yes, you do that, no, no, uh, no way. No. At, 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 in the case of ERC, I think it will be uh, difficult to implement it yeah. this way, yeah. uh, partly because the certification you, you described would have to be agreed at European level, which uh, I don't see it happening uh, tomorrow morning. Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I think this uh, issue of diversity is uh, yeah. very, very critical, and particularly gender promotion. In, in which in all, almost every field means promotion of women is uh, absolute uh, priority and we yeah. must uh, I must say on this side we uh, by uh, we, we took a, a significant number of measures which are slightly different from the one you said for example one thing we do we have three programs one which called starting ones from two to seven years of the PhD the other one consolidated seven to twelve years which is the way we prioritize younger people and for women who have children, automatically the upper limit, seven or 12, is pushed by 18 months per child without any other indication, just the birth certificate. For men, this can be pushed if they have taken the leave of absence. And actually what is remarkable is that this is not only formally implemented, but it works. That is the success rate of women who are above the limit is absolutely the same as the others. Yeah. So this is one way of telling people, we definitely want to promote mm -hmm. women and we know that the impact for the moment, maybe it will change, of uh, having giving birth and uh, taking care of children is much more important on women's career than right. others. So, Gabriella Angeli, I'd be very interested to hear of your views about the sort of teeth might be required or external pressures that might be required to, to give teeth to seeing these develop. So, Gabriella, perhaps you'd like to start, if you think of the institutions you know. <laughs> How would you like them to be forced to do more than they're doing? Oh, oh. <laughs> well, I guess Sorry. It's actually a hard question. Um, well, I mean, or wish definitely is, as I mentioned earlier, that all of the heads of the research institution, possibly also some uh, funding uh, agencies, do take a look at this and formally, uh, not just say we think it's great, but formally endorse it and say, this is going to be a code of ethics that we stand behind right. and will um, push also in or within our institution. So that's that's the way how we're we're seeing it. But if we're getting, of course, support also from funding agencies such as ERC, of course, that would be right. uh, fantastic. Right, Jenny. Well. I think I love all these ideas. I think that uh, the teeth thing is not my specialty. <laughs> um, so I trust those who work a lot on adherence. Um, but I do think that the, part, the point I made about these values conflicting poses a bit of a challenge for the teeth thing. Because then, it, then, I mean, the point is that we, I guess what I think we need is I think we need higher education to think systemically about ethics. And just not just, so basically what I say to my doctoral students in, in the sciences who I focus on is, we're not here to be the ethics police. You are. <laughs> a lot of what we talked about today is, is, is um, you know, misbehavior and conflicts of interest. Very important to have standards. But that's the minimum thing. But now we're talking about these aspirational goals of making ethics really, I'm sorry, making science really truth-seeking, really inclusive, et cetera. And to me, because they can conflict, 
and they will. All of these goals will conflict with each other. People need rigorous education in ethical reasoning, which is just as rigorous as science education. Right. And so the question is how to get the funding and support at the university level to have that be, what I'd rather have a requirement, if I had to put teeth anywhere, I'd like to have every doctoral student not just have one of those superficial IRB fake compliance courses, but I'd like them to have to pass a rigorous exam showing how they would deal with certain ethical dilemmas. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'd like, and everybody who will become a head of a lab someday will have really learned how to do that thinking. Right. Because I think some people don't know how to, I don't think that many people even at the World Economic Forum yeah. have the tools of reasoning to look at these things, whereas almost everybody here knows how to make a statistical right. assessment or something like that. Right. It's basic philosophical literacy at, yep. uh, at, that I think we're missing. I can give uh, two examples of where endorsement uh, a formal endorsement is necessary, but maybe not sufficient, if you see what I mean, but, but necessary. So one is in the dual use stuff. So a whole group of editors got together and all signed up to setting up mechanisms within the journals to cope with dual use papers, just to be mindful about how you're going to get extra security advice as to whether this thing should be published or not, or what the risks and benefits are. And I think on the whole that's worked. I think a lot of journals have certainly done that. And they put their names on a website so that you, you can always refer to them if, you, if it's not happening. Another case is the National Science Foundation who make it a condition of funding, at least of some of their grants, that you do have to have a mentoring process in place for postdocs. And they're the first to admit, I have to say, that they, ha they, they cannot police that. You know, so how much teeth you can give to that requirement is an interesting question. Okay, so... We've had a good expose of some of these things. We haven't gone into depth in the thing. I hope some of you may have already had a chance to read it. If you haven't, never mind. You've heard what we've said. Feel free to make a comment. Put up your hand, and we need to have a microphone. So I see at least three people. Thank you very much. And do say who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Tim Fell. I'm the CEO of a company called Synthase, which produces software for the life sciences, and I'm a WEF technology pioneer. The company is rather, so not me. Um, thank you very much. Absolutely stimulating discussion. I could ask a thousand questions. The first observation I would make is that you seem to be talking about academia, but I would just like to say that this, of course, extends to industry. Um, Gabriella, I'm sure you looked at many different codes of practices. In 2007, in the UK, Sir David King came up with Code of Practice for Science with seven um, uh, bullet points, really. One of the number four is that you must act lawfully I don't see lawfully in here at all, and I would have thought that should be front and center. Did you discuss it? Um, well, I mean, we, as actually mentioned earlier, uh, there are certain basics that you need to, I mean, that's, you know, uh, things like conflict of interest and things like that, which are the absolute basis that you, that you need to adhere to. And the standard or the code of ethics that we wrote um, was more of this, what you mentioned in terms of aspirational. So um, being lawful for me will be something which is, which is a basic, I mean, if I'm not lawful, then I have trouble somewhere else, not with the code of ethics. But the, um, yeah, I think that's maybe one of the reasons why it's not explicitly uh, mentioned. In, in it. Do you want to come back? <laughs> so, well, let, let me move on, because we do have some other people. So over there, microphone. And then there. And then there. Uh, Brian Schmidt, Australian National University. I'm the vice chancellor and president of that. So uh, in terms of being aspirational, I think it's quite strong. But if you read it, and I have to, for example, I have been asked to see if I would endorse this. And in my university, although I could endorse it as the uh, vice chancellor, it really needs to go through what we call the academic board. And the academic board is going to see the conflicts and will chew it to bits that way. Um, and it also has, to me, a sense of each individual is responsible for doing that. And I'll give you an example where that might be problematic. Uh, I have a whole range of people. And uh, I intentionally keep some of my staff from mentoring. And I intentionally keep some of my staff from going to government people and telling them what they're doing, because that is not a strong skill set from them. And I do not want to subject anyone to them. Isaac Newton would be a good example of someone who you would not want to be mentoring people. Uh, <laughs> but he was a very important person. So it's, it's not my ideal staff member, but the reality is I have people like that. So I think as an institutional level, I can probably assign uh, uh, 
sign up to it on an aspirational thing as long as I realize that I'm going to hold myself sort of, it's, it's not a, 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 you know, a black line thing, which it sort of feels like right now and which would be problematic. Yeah. I mean, okay. maybe just to Nicole. add on that, um, I think that's also one of the reasons why we didn't call it code of conduct, but code of ethics. And that was, we had some discussions uh, regarding this. And um, yeah, coming in this uh, aspirational thing, that's why we called it code of ethics. Do you want to comment? I'd let, I'd let other people speak, but I'm, I'm on board with that completely. And I think that, that being, uh, so it should not be rejected. Bec maybe there, I, I didn't really think I would suggest a very practical thing, but it may be that the report, if it's not too late, is it too late to add or change anything? Um, I mean, we're always happy yeah. to take. It might be worth yeah. having some yeah. kind of paragraph saying that the acknowledgement that there are conflicts of obligation yeah. and that with, there's a hope for rigorous ethics training about the judgment involved about the decisions you're talking about and something like that so that it doesn't immediately get rejected because people don't understand that you mm -hmm. knew that. Okay, yeah. next one. And then, here we are. Hi, um, Max Price. I'm the president of the University of Cape Town. Um, and my comment is particularly to Jean-Pierre and to the uh, fund and potential funders. I absolutely agree with you that central funders, large funders, cannot police the implementation and monitoring of the codes and, uh, and guidelines of ethics. That does have to be devolved to the institutions and therefore those institutions have to have the structures. Uh, but there's a real risk that, uh, particularly given the inequality of institutional resources and the history of that, um, that that reinforces that divide between who can do research and who can't and who can get funding and who can't, especially between the global north and south. And that um, if that becomes, as it should be, a requirement of, 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 of the funding. And it's especially a problem where, because there are economies of scale of such structures. If you are doing a lot of research, uh, the number of IRBs or, or, or people involved in that uh, doesn't, it's not a linear relationship to the amount of research that, that you're doing. and so. Uh, when, if one is on the development curve for research universities, um, the costs of that are much higher. And my plea would be to explicitly allow the uh, funding of those um, institutional structures that both do the training, have the codes, but police ensure that the data is kept for 15 years, ensure that there's regular auditing of the work that's, that's going on, and that that's uh, built into and funded by the grants possibly differentially from institutions which already have those structures widely in place. Well, I think uh, you're touching uh, some of the limitations of uh, organization at the level of the European uh, Union. I in our case, in the sense, the money we are given is uh, as the very specific purpose of supporting research. So, for example, supporting institutions would get together to improve this situation would be, for the moment, uh, outside our um, things we can uh, um, legally fund. And uh, this is part of the things we are looking at the next framework program, 2021, 2027. So we're looking for more agility for the res uh, European Research Council. And uh, among the agility, definitely we feel that we should be able to really accompany this and encourage and uh, support um, actions of, the, of this nature. For the moment, this is not possible, or only w in ways which are so <laughs> complicated that we actually don't do it. But we feel that definitely we should have the leeway. In particular, if you look at the amount of money which would be needed to have an impact for such things compared to our budget, I mean, our budget every year is more or less 2 billion euro. And of course, the amount of money you're talking about, if you really want to accompany and encourage and make it more visible, you're talking about 100,000 of euros. So it's, uh, it's totally, um, I mean, it should be just a trivial thing to do. Yeah. For the moment, uh, legally, it's very complicated. So definitely, we're looking forward to be more proactive in this way, that is to not only encourage, but really show that we are committed <laughs> to this to happen. Uh, but we need to, to progress on that. So, so this is just to show that uh, the urgency for us of an uh, ethical review shows that we have just created in the, in the Scientific Council a, a really a task force on this. And uh, the next uh, plenary meeting uh, will be have the first report of the task force. So for us, it's really a priority at this moment to be better, to be more efficient, to be better organized, and uh, which is completely endorsed by the members of the Scientific Council. And may I put a plug in for some representative of the Global South in the task force? Sorry? May I put in a plug for some representative of the Global South in in the task force. Okay, well, at this, at this moment, this task force was really 
meant to be very practical in the sense to review what we have been doing to improve it, but maybe we should really actually, it could be something we should take up at the Global Research Council, which you know is meeting every year, and that maybe we should uh, join forces on this, that is really have uh, established worldwide some kind of, and maybe bringing up actually this uh, called, ethic for, uh, called, uh, Next. code for ethics for, for science. Next point from the audience. I'm a principal and vice chancellor of McGill University. And uh, I, I think it's great that the young scientists have had this workshop and produced this document. Uh, whether I could bring it to my campus, and maybe we think about this in a traditional way, but I think it would be difficult because while everybody reading those principles would say yes, yes, but they wouldn't call them all principles. Some would be goals and some would be principles. Many people would say, not engaging with decision makers is unethical? No, <laughs> many people would say, no, it's not unethical not to engage with them. Uh, it's a good thing to do. If we want our science to have impact, if we want our policy makers to have evidence-based policy, we should do that. But it wouldn't be at the level of those principles that are deep down, like integrity, accountability, for example, I'll give you just another example, is supporting diversity. To me, at the deep down level, it is this, uh, designing experiment that bring the set of data that will provide a non-biased uh, uh, result. That it would be unethical to design an experiment that doesn't do that. Now, attracting people who have not participated into science is a great thing to do, we all endorse that, but it would be a goal, an aspirational goal, as you put it. And so when, and it may be just a matter of defining the words, but principles are deep rooted as protecting not only academia, but of course the whole enterprise of research. So we have to be very, very clear as to what are the lines in the sand. And as we know, it's not simple because many a times even those deep rooted principles will clash. And then the question, is there one that dominates is there one that is more important than the others? That's very, very difficult. Can I, can I just ask you a question? Um, as a leader of a university, if you put this in front of people, you stimulated a discussion, can't you, can't you see something coming out and sticking to the wall that is a step forward? And are you willing to do that? Uh, there would be certainly a very lively discussion. I can tell you that people will not want to see each one of those called a principle. Understood. It's the word principle, because Understood. we have principles in but, our but, university. So we, uh, and sorry, they sorry, would sorry, find it difficult to, right, so to the, the, have the, that the, label. The, the thing I wanted to yeah. not allow the discussion, I don't, I don't mean this is a criticism at all, I mean this is exactly right about exactly what will happen yeah. in academia, <laughs> no yeah. question. But at the same time, we can't have a collective editing session where we get all the words yeah. exactly right. So yeah. the, own, the best hope for this to have an impact is to take it out there, yeah. acknowledge that the language is imprecise and you know mm -hmm. flawed, but the principles that, that are aspirational, the even goals. even if there's yeah. just one that then sticks, yeah. that would be yeah. great, right? Yeah. Is so that fair enough? can I quickly ask, so if this would be redefined as, yeah. let's say, goals, yeah. then you wouldn't see a problem with this? Uh, I mean, I'm, I don't want to put you on I the spot, again, but in general, again, it's... Pursuing the truth is not just right. a goal. It is a deep-rooted principle. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And no, fair uh, enough. there's no good scientific enterprise if we can't uh, uh, commit to that principle. So next next comment or question? Yeah, I would like to follow up on the point that was initially raised. Did you say raised. who you are? Oh, sorry. I'm Iruka Okeke. I'm a professor at the University of Ibado in Nigeria. And I'd like to follow up... Um, on the point raised by the president of UCT um, about the need for, you know, actually supporting the creation of structures in institutions in resource limited um, yeah. countries. We actually have uh, a, an example of how this worked very well. I think 25 years ago, most human research was done without IRB approval in African countries, and now most institutions have got IRBs. Most African journals require ethical approval before they will publish studies. And so I think it, it serves as a model for us to create those structures and um, funding agencies that fund a lot of res global health research and similar multi-country res research should consider it as a, towards the goal of supporting diversity 
in helping to build those structures as part of helping to ensure that science occurs in those countries. Right. Gabriel, do you want to say any more about the interests of under, quote, under-resourced environments and were they represented in your group? Um, I don't have in mind who, do you have in mind who you put? Uh, I, I, to be honest, I don't, I don't have, I, you know, I remember the people okay, and that's okay. who you're interacting with, fair right? Enough, so enough. I, I only know, remember from a few where exactly oh, they enough. came from. I mean, yeah. these are 30 people coming from all kinds of yeah. backgrounds. So yeah. I, I, I can't recall. Okay. But anyway, that's a good example. Um, one here. Um, if I can give some, <coughs> perhaps some practical advice from my experience. Um, these are great, whether they're values, goals, or principles, or whatever. Um, we've written them down, okay? But you've got to live your values. That's what counts. And how do you do that? We don't want this to become a box-ticking exercise, and yes, I've now, you know, I'm ethical. Um, and you can look at other industries. Some industries are not so good. Uh, the, the medical industry is great, actually. If you ask doctors whether they're doing well, they say, yeah, we're doing terribly well. Everything we do is perfect. It's great. And, and in fact, one of the reasons is they only kill one person at a time. If you look at the airline industry, they kill 300 people at a time. When a plane falls out of the sky, everybody dies. And the culture in that industry is completely different. Everybody from the ground staff to the pilots to the CEO are always asking one question. They ask, what does an early warning look like? So if I'm thinking of doing some research, I have a, I have a postulation. I think I know what's going to happen. And then I can sort of construct what might or might not go wrong. But if you ask, <coughs> what does an early warning look like? You put yourself in a different position you say to yourself, something has already gone wrong. Not it might go wrong, it already has gone wrong. What does that look like? So just a little bit of practical advice. If you can stimulate that in your institutions or your companies or in your labs, you can actually live these values. Thank can, you. Can, I, can I do a real quick follow-up? Yeah, okay. Just I think that the, learning to identify the values at stake in the research as you design the project and show where they're conflicting values would be a way to do that. Not a warning of a problem, but even identifying in every project what, what, what values it's serving. Thank you very much. Please. I'm Mark Greiton, Chancellor, President of Washington University in St. Louis. We have a very large research enterprise. I'm a scientist myself. And there are two points in this code that uh, interest me. One is pursuing truth, and I see so much in biological, biomedical research that's emerging as not reproducible. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how such a document can improve the situation. The second is I really like this notion on mentorship. In the United States, at least, and there are different countries represented here with different policies, but in the United States, uh, our federal support is predicated on the notion that PhD research and education <laughs> are inextricably intertwined. But what's evolved over time, and I see it especially with NIH-funded research, that the students are being regarded as employees by their research mentors. And they're not being given the opportunity for their education. So I really think this uh, area of mentorship is extremely important. And PhDs need to be prepared more broadly than just a research, and some of them call themselves, I'm a research slave. Yeah, I know. And, yeah, absolutely. And I think we need uh, some strength in this kind of recommendation to improve PhD education, at can least I, in the United but States. But can I, can I just ask you, in your position, do you feel able to develop the strength of that culture, if you like, and practice within your university? It, it's a very worthwhile discussion, and a document like this can really stimulate okay. uh, reassessment and perhaps the development of uh, procedures within our 
university that right. could improve PhD education. Right. So we're, we're, we're running out of time because, in fact, we have run out of time. Um, I'm just going to ask Gabriella. Thank you very much for the document, you and your colleagues. Um, is this it, or can you revise it? Are um, you going to try and get feedback <laughs> of this sort anymore? Or, or sh because I mean, we, we, we can run with this, you know, yeah, as you've seen. Yeah, I, we definitely love to get your, your feedback. I need to talk to the World, of, World Economic Forum people in what sense we can still adapt it. But uh, nevertheless, we, we would love to see, see feedback and, and comments um, okay. about it. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thank you to everyone who contributed, and thank you to the panelists for contributing as well. Thank you. Thank you.